Well, hello there. This is Chris from the Stamp Coding YouTube channel. I'm here with my friend, uh, Paul Rimmer. So Paul, can you say a word about who you are? I, I knew you, Chris, from uh, when we did our PhD work at The Ohio State University. You were working on more astronomy slash cosmology questions at the time, and I was leaning more into astrochemistry. Uh, after I left uh, the Ohio State University, I went to St. Andrews, where I really started looking into atmospheric chemistry. And now I'm at the University of Cambridge, where I've combined my knowledge of atmospheric chemistry and chemical kinetics with some laboratory work in Origins of Life. So, uh, so this has been a very busy set of weeks for you, uh, the last two weeks, I think. Um, so tell us what's been happening on your end. Yeah, sure. So a few years ago, Jane Greaves, uh, found uh, a spectroscopic signature around one millimeter wavelength that is consistent with the presence of phosphine. Uh, this is one phosphorus atom bound to three hydrogen atoms uh, in the clouds of Venus. And there's some indication that uh, phosphine is on rocky planets, a good biosignature. And so this could be a sign of life on Venus. More needs to be known, but so far, the only known explanation that we've been able to find for this molecule has been life. And we've looked at a lot of uh, uh, known abiotic explanations. None of them can explain this feature, but there's a lot that's not known about Venus. And there's also a, a lot that's not known about how life might produce this particular molecule. So Paul, I think you're being a little bit modest because the, you know there was a, a, a scholarly article that was published on, oh yeah on this that has been circulated around the world to great oh yeah fanfare. no it's um, um but <laughs> your name is on this article is what i'm saying oh yeah so what i did was i did the photochemical modeling i created a full atmospheric model of venus i didn't know this at the time but it was the second such model that's ever been created the first was created about a month before the paper came out um and uh, I was able to use this model and what we know about the chemistry of phosphine to estimate the lifetime that phosphine would have in the atmosphere of Venus. And that's something that you need to know in order to figure out whether any sort of hypothetical explanation that you have for this molecule uh, works or not. And so that's what the, uh, what the biologists in the group and uh, what the other atmospheric chemists in the group really worked hard to do is to explore all these abiotic explanations, but then also explore a sort of known, known biotic explanations to see whether they could overcome the photochemical destruction of phosphine and actually produce enough to explain the observations. And so I was the sort of link between the sort of observations and then all of the, all of the theorizing about how you would get this particular molecule. Let me try to repeat back kind of what I heard to, to make sure I understand it. So yeah, sure. you're trying to understand how long, you know, each phosphine molecule might survive in the cloud in spite of how hot it is, in spite of how much radiation there is from the sun and things like that. It's, it's, yeah. So that was your contribution to the paper. Exactly. And you mentioned the two main ways that phosphine is destroyed by radiation from the sun and uh, by heat near the near near the surface right and as everyone knows venus is this super hot planet which is closer to the sun and so it's it's yep. remarkable that that something like that could could survive even in, in that environment i guess yeah um i, so just, I still find it quite puzzling myself <laughs> sure so just to be clear so so you're not in charge of the study right so you weren't the the main you weren't the lead of the study no it's um it was a team of around 15 um and uh it spanned observers uh mostly out of the uk uh jane greaves from cardiff um anita from manchester um hideo sagawa uh did uh some of the re retrieval and other models to try to really look at the observations and figure out how much of this molecule you would need in order to explain them uh, and he's from japan and then there's me from Cambridge in the UK. And then uh, a large contingent of the team that was from MIT, uh, specifically Sarah Seeger's research group that has been working a long time on this all small molecules project where they look at 
all the small molecules uh, in this uh, sort of computational machine learning style approach to try to figure out which of these can be produced on what sorts of planets and what quantities that may or may not indicate life. And so uh, one of the members of that project had, uh, uh, Clara Sousa Silva, had uh, predicted that phosphine would be a good biosignature on oxidized rocky planets. And that just happened to happen um, coincidentally with Jane Greaves finding it. And so... Uh, finding, uh, it, finding it how? So Jane Greaves found this first with the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, which is a telescope uh, on the island of Hawaii. Um, and this looks at a very, very different region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, this is millimeter uh, slash sub-millimeter spectroscopy. And there is a feature that, that was expected um, at one millimeter wavelength if phosphine was present. This is due to Phosphine is a molecule, it rotates, and um, uh, the way that it, that it rotates is quantized, so it can be hit by this one millimeter wavelength light, and it can knock it into the next quantized state for its rotation. And uh, that's what's seen, is actually not the light, but the absence of light by all of that phosphine absorbing that particular wavelength. So is the James Clerk's Maxwell Telescope then also the, the Alma Telescope in Chile, right? The, the yeah, so the follow-up was looking at this with Alma. Alma has uh, uh, better spectral resolution and better angular resolution. And so in principle, you, you could get a much clearer picture of this, of this feature. And also looking at it with a different telescope in a different location. If you see the same thing, that lends credence to that it's actually there. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so for the students out there watching, if they want to go on to study, um, you know, life on other planets, uh, life in the solar system, uh, life in the clouds of Venus, potentially, I mean, uh, things are still, you know, we don't, nobody knows exactly for sure. But this is a very exciting result. Um, so what's your advice for those students who want to pursue this uh, for their future careers? Yeah. Um... So the sort of advice that I would give for students who are interested in these sorts of questions, these are interdisciplinary questions. So uh, the first piece of advice that I would give is that you need to be comfortable with feeling confused and you need to be humble enough to ask questions, especially when you don't understand terms that different scientists are using. One of the things though that I would say is that what unites all of these different fields, biology, chemistry, physics, astronomy, has been computers and specifically particular sorts of computer programs that allow us to model all of these different systems in different ways and to really make predictions. I work with computational models pretty much all, all day. And so the sort of advice that I would give is uh, be willing to ask the sort of simple questions. Um, and then the academic advice that I would give is uh, uh, certainly learn a lot about math, learn a lot about chemistry, um, and learn a lot about uh, about computer coding. It's it's not as 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 hard as it appears to get into. And there's just some really amazing things that you can end up doing with it. It was good to catch up with you a little bit before we started recording this thing, Paul. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So we've been we've been friends for too long, I think. <laughs> but um, but I hope you have a great weekend, and I really appreciate you carving out the time for all this. It was, it, it was absolutely my pleasure.